It's an honor to be here and a great opportunity for me to continue my project on the connections uh, between the Middle East and Europe, in particular Italy, and to concentrate on the area of Bologna, Modena, Ferrara and Mantova. Um, within the broader theme of pre-modern interactions between the Middle East and Europe, I should like to concentrate today on the European artistic and intellectual engagement with Islamic culture during the medieval and humanist Renaissance periods. And I'd like to include some of its manifestations in Bologna and the neighboring cities of Modena and Ferrara. The engagement of humanist scholars is preceded by a lengthy history of engagement with the Middle East. In Spain, there had been an Arab presence after the conquest for several centuries, so that there is a long history of interactions. In Italy, uh, there was an Arab presence in Sicily and Southern Italy for 200 years from the 9th to the, 12th, to the 11th century. And the Cappella Palatina in Palermo is an extraordinary artistic test testimony of this. Here you can see the interior of the Cappella Palatina covered by mosaic decoration in Byzantine style showing uh, episodes of the Bible. But if you look up to the ceiling, you can see a wooden mukarnas or stalactite uh, ceiling painted in Arabic manner. And you can see here a detail and hopefully you can also see the Kufic Arabic inscription around the stella forms here. An example of the intellectual engagement is the falconry book, uh, The Art of an Andin Kunabribus by the Emperor Frederick II, descendant of the normal rulers of Sicily, based on Arabic treatises. Such texts that were pro the products of a rich and varied intellectual life that had developed in the Islamic world from the 8th century on. In cities spreading from as far as Bukhara in Central Asia to Isfahan, Baghdad, Damascus, Cairo, Qairawan in North Africa, and Cordoba in Spain. All were great intellectual centers with famous libraries patronized by bibliophile caliphs and princes, housing thousands of books in many languages and on a variety of subjects, illustrated and not illustrated. They attracted an international gathering of scholars of different confessions to discuss and write on religious matters, philosophy, medicine and other sciences. The list of scholarship, including classical texts mediated through Arabic, had in fact provided an important part of Europe's intellectual landscape since the Middle Ages. Through Latin translations of important texts by such figures as Al-Farabi or Al-Farabius, Ibn Sina or Avicenna, and Ibn Rushd or Averroes. In Italy, the knowledge and teaching of Arabic was fostered by such institutions as the Scuola Medica Salernitana, which flourished in Salerno between the 10th and the 13th centuries. Here you have a beautiful representation of the Scuola in a manuscript here in Bologna, a Hebrew translation of an Arabic version of Avicenna's canon. The Scuola was the earliest medieval medical school in southern Italy, and Salerno was the most important center of medical knowledge in Western Europe at the time. The canon of medicine by Avicenna, the famous Persian physician, astronomer and philosopher of the 10th, early 11th century, was one of the most influential of these Arabic texts. It's an encyclopedic work that reflects the contemporary state of knowledge in the Islamic world, incorporating earlier traditions, but not just Greek, also Indian and Chinese. Nothing like it existed in Europe, and it continued to be studied in European universities for several centuries, before eventually being superseded by William Harvey's new understanding of blood circulation, 
and by advances in anatomy by deception made here in Bologna. Another major text was the De Materia Medica of Dioscorides, a Greek physician and botanist of the first century AD. Here you can see a portrait from an early 13th century Arabic manuscript now kept in Istanbul. In five volumes, it's essentially a text on plants and their curative properties and how to use them to prepare what we would call now uh, natural remedies. It provides an interesting example, not just of transmission of knowledge, but also of collaboration between scholars. The original Greek text was translated in the ninth century by the famous scholar Hunayn ibn Ishaq, first into Syriac and then into Arabic, but with the collaboration of a Greek scholar, Istefan ibn Basel or Stephanos. Thus, foreshadowing later attempts not just to provide the best translation, but also to annotate and expand. This was not an isolated instance, but was part of a major intellectual project, the so-called translation movement, that took place in Baghdad, promoted by the Abbasid Caliphs from the 9th century, aimed at learning from preserving and augmenting Greek philosophical and scientific knowledge. The collaboration between two scholars of different extraction is also worth noticing in this particular instance. The result is the transmission of knowledge from Greek into Syriac, and in this 12th century Arabic manuscript in Mashhad, you can see the Syriac glossa. And I hope if I and move the cursor. I hope you can see the cursor on your screen. These are the Syria, Syriac glossy in the manuscript. So it was translated from Greek into Syriac and then into Arabic, which including additions of Arab and Persian knowledge, and then from Arabic into Latin. Indeed, as well as Salerno, Another major translation project of the 12th century took place in Toledo in Spain, involving Jewish, Christian and Muslim scholars and provided Latin versions of the important philosophical and scientific heritage that had been transmitted and augmented through Arabic. In this way, preserving both Greek and Middle Eastern knowledge and making it available to the Western world. In seeking to revive uh, the study of classical texts, particularly in philosophy and medicine, humanist scholars of the 15th and 16th centuries could thus call upon earlier Latin translations from Arabic. But it's important to mention that they also made or commissioned further such translations. Manuscripts with classical texts of interest to the humanists were sought out and translated by scholars such as Andrea Alpago, of 1450, 1522, a physician at the Venetian embassy in Damascus from Belluno and usually represented with a turban. Alpago is famous for his revision published in 1527 of Gerard of Cremona's late 12th century Latin translation of Avicenna's Canon of Medicine. In addition, as we learn from his nephew Paolo Alpago, he engaged in an extensive and arduous search for Arabic manuscripts. He traveled to Cyprus, Syria, and Egypt, and found some of Avicenna's lesser known treatises, which he then translated for the first time. Here in Bologna is a splendid illustrated Ar Arabic example of Dioscorides de Materia Medica, or in Arabic, Kitab al Hashaish. Book of Simples on the Substances Used for Medical Treatment. It is one that I've been studying for some time, including recently in preparation for a publication, and I should like to thank Rita De Tata and the present team of librarians at the Special Collections of the University Library for their help. It is part of the bequest of Count Luigi Ferdinando Marsili, 1658-1730, a 
a captain involved in the wars against the Ottomans, who brought back to Bologna other Arabic material, many manuscripts, including beautiful illuminated Korans, and other objects now preserved in the Museo Civico Medievale. He studied natural history and botany at Bologna University, and it's doubtless because of his passion for botany that he acquired the Dioscorides. It has many wonderful paintings of plants and also animals and minerals. It is written in a beautiful nasc with chapter headings in gold, as you can see here. And here you have a detail of the irises, one of my favorite. And has a colophon with the date. Which corresponds to 15 May 1245. The frontispiece was doubtless a splendid painting, but is unfortunately now rather damaged. From an iconographical point of view, its general composition conforms to a Byzantine type, borrowing the iconography of Christ enthroned and flanked by saints, one that is ultimately royal in origin. But its theme is the transmission of knowledge. The three figures are to be identified as the inscriptions above them tell us as Dioscorides, so you have here Surat Dioscorides al Hakim, Lukman on the right, uh, often cited as an ancient source of knowledge, and none other than Aristotle here on the left. Now, from the detail, I hope you can see it a little bit better. Um, you can see that Dioscorides is seated centrally on a throne under a baldachin. He's represented as what I call a scholar prince, a sovereign among scholars, a Malik al -Olama. His intellectual lineage is indicated by his taking a fruit from a bowl that Aristotle is offering him. This is the hand of Dioscorides taking a fruit from the bowl that Aristotle is holding. An iconographical representation of the transmission of knowledge theme. So this painting is interesting in this context as it provides a visual iconographical reference to the transmission of knowledge that the text itself embodies. Through time, texts from Arabic sometimes generated vol voluminous commentaries. The treatise by Dioscorides was extensively commented on by such eminent figures as the humanist Pierandrea Mattioli, a 16th century physician and botanist from Siena. I have recently studied an impressive Latin translation of Dioscorides with Mattioli's commentary in the Estense Library in Modena as part of a project with my colleague Norihito Hayashi of Kyoto University. And here I must thank Nadia De Lutio and Martina Bagnoli and their teams for facilitating the research. Printed in Venice in 1565, it has a splendid red Morocco leather uh, well, it is illustrated by another humanist, Giorgio Liberale, as you can see from these two pages of the Aconite. And it has a splendid red Morocco leather binding executed in Venice in the same year, 1565. But, and this brings us to another important Middle Eastern connection in Ottoman style with a central medallion filled with floral motifs, corner pieces, and the very deep pressure molded medallions that give it a, a three-dimensional effect. The doublures, or the inside of the binding, are also decorated, but now in an exceptional contrast in a European style, with at the center, the coat of arms and blazon, army and impresa, of Alfonso II d'Este, 1533 1597, for whom it was made. And just a reminder, he was the grandson of Alfonso I d'Este, the second patron of Ariosto, the first having been Hippolito, 
and was himself the patron, amongst others, of Torquato Tasso. So, on the one hand, we have a text representing the 15th and 16th century humanist effort to explore Greek philosophical and medical knowledge mediated through Arabic, and on the other, a binding that is a splendid example of the phenomenon of the fascination with decorative motifs in Ottoman style, which struck artists and intellectuals for their beauty and novelty when compared with the somehow duller, more traditional ones made in Europe at the time. Their appreciation is also demonstrated in paintings of scholars or scholar saints in which such Mamluk or Ottoman bindings are reproduced, as in Carpaccio's Sant'Agustin of 1502, where, apart from other objects that may be of Middle Eastern origin, such a binding takes a prominent place on the writing table. Here. And this is a detail in which you can see the book with such a binding and a comparison of a Mamluk binding of the same period. Cultural appreciation is not, though, immune to events. The Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453 and less than a century later the first siege of Vienna were profound shocks. And fear of Ottoman expansion in Eastern Europe led to the production of widely circulated visual representations in the form of printed images, woodcuts, and etchings. The printing presses were beginning to produce increasing amounts of propagandistic material, promoting visual and conceptual stereotypes, prominent among them portrayals of the Turk as a type. Notable those by Dürer after his visits to Venice, and later Erhard Schön in the 1530s. Here you see Turkish atro atrocities in Vienna woods where children are impaled on, on uh, the bodies of murdered women. The Turks were perceived as bloodthirsty and cruel successors to the Mongols. And Renaissance scholars' writings on the origins invoked the feared image of the Asian steppe nomad. For an heir Silvio Piccolomini, 1405-1464, who became Pope Pius II in 1458, the conquering Turks were to be identified as Scythians and therefore part of the barbarous people of the steppes presenting an apocalyptic threat to civilization and to Christianity itself. Nevertheless, fear of the Ottomans failed to hold the peaceful interchanges that went alongside armed conflict. Trade continued with its own surplus of knowledge and further information along with material goods was cir circulated by diplomatic envoys, merchants, collectors and scholars. Objects are gradually assembled into collections that constitute a cultural vision, a process that starts early and continues until the 17th and 18th centuries, with private collections eventually becoming museums. Collecting was fostered by intellectuals such as Luigi Marsili, 1658-1730, Giuseppe Mezzofanti, 1774-1849, both in Bologna, where Mezzofanti was a professor of Oriental languages, Arabic and Hebrew, by collectors such as Ferdinando Cospi, and in Milan, Manfredo Settala, who was also traveling to the Middle East, and later in Venice by Jacopo Nanni, and by rich and well-known patrons such as the Medici and the Este of Ferrara and Modena. The extensive course typify, in fact, the multifaceted engagement in Renaissance Europe with the Middle Eastern world, involving not just the constant of trade, diplomacy and sporadic warfare, but also the intellectual domain represented by the humanist scholars I have mentioned.
The continuing acquisition of objects and an interest in ornaments of Middle Eastern origin provide models that enrich the world of design. The circulation of design features, Ottoman in particular, may be exemplified by gilded leathers or corridoro. Apart from the Dioscorides Mattioli binding already mentioned, examples include wall hangings, a more common type, and shields in Ottoman style preserved in various collections. Gilded leathers were produced in numerous centers in Venice, Naples, Rome, but also Modena, Ferrara, and Bologna, with production reaching its highest point in the 16th and 17th centuries. There are notices of such work done for distancy already towards the end of the 15th century, and later in the 16th, Hercule II d'Este acquired large quantities of gilded leathers from Bologna, including in 1542, an order of 526 gilded leather rectangular pieces from the craftsman Marcantonio Mazzante, for which he paid 111 gold ducats. He also promoted the international diffusion of gilded leather from Bologna and Ferrara, sending examples to France that inspired an order by the famous Diane de Poitiers, Duchess of Valentinois, who was struck by their beauty. Both Leonardo Fioravanti in 1572 and Tommaso Gazzoni in 1585 emphasized in their treatises that the technique came from the Middle East and reached Italy through Spain. Described by these authors, and as I could confirm by studying directly with the conservator of the gilded leather shields in Ottoman style preserved at Palazzo Ducale in Venice, the process is a complicated one. First, the leather is covered with a light blue, and then a sheet of silver is attached, which is then burnished so that it shines. Then a light transparent gold color varnish is applied to cover the silver leaf and give it the appearance of shiny gold. Then the design is traced in ink and in some cases brought out in relief by pressure molding. Then colored varnishes may be applied, red, green, blue, followed by a transparent varnish over the whole. And finally, tooling may be used to add small decorative motifs, such as small circles, dots, etc. Here you can see a rotella or a shield of this kind with Ottoman um, motifs um, in Venice in the Doge's Palace Armory. And here it's a brocchiere or another shield without the um, metal boss. It's lost its metal boss. But you can see from the detail how close to Ottoman design it is, and it uses the gilded type of uh, varnish and blue and red in this case. Designs varied from very simple contrasts of varnishes in silver and gold to designs of both flat and in relief of flowers or vegetable motifs. Combined with motifs so typical of Renaissance Italy, some have unequivocally Middle Eastern patterns as we have seen with the shields. But two such extraordinary gilded leather panels, probably of the end of the 16th century, that I had the privilege to study and publish some time ago and have revisited more recently, are in the Museo Civico Medievale here in Bologna. And I'm happy to thank the then director Renzo Grandi and curator Carla Bernardini, and the present director Massimo Medica and curators Antonella Mampieri and Silvia Battistini for their assistance with the research. They're quite large, you can see the measurements, measuring several meters in length and width, made up of several rectangular pieces stitched together and were part of the furnishings of the famous Bargellini family. This is a detail. They have this striking flaming vertical pattern recalling Ikat textiles of Central Asia and Turkey. And in one fragment, 
there is a striking horizontal band, this one here, um, with a sinuous stalk with knots of foliage around it, little flowers and broad leaves that curl back. Motifs derived from luxury Ottoman textiles, as can be seen in, so sorry, this is a detail of that, uh, of that uh, band. You can see the similarities with the Ottoman, Ottoman silk, such as this one of the second half of the 16th century with the same sinuous um, stalk with knots, little flowers and foliage. Also notice the presence of here in the gilded leather hanging uh, of the tulips at the bottom. Perhaps you can see them better in this detail. You can see the tulip here and here. An Ottoman decorative motif that came to the fore in Europe exactly at this period. An extraordinary example of transmateriality of motifs traveling across media is provided by a wonderful silk textile also preserved in the Museo Civico Medievale. It has the same flaming vertical motif with a very similar chromatism of red, white, and green. Here, alternated with columns of, again, a sinuous stalk with broad peony flowers and little flowers and broad leaves to curl back. This type of decoration becomes common in Italian textiles and wool tapestries from the end of the 16th century. This points to an increasingly international vocabulary of ornament and Ottoman and other Middle Eastern design features would indeed become part of the European vocabulary of ornament across various media, leather, textiles, metal walls, ceramics, etc. In the first half of the 16th century, pattern books such as those by Pellegrino and Peter Flötner include large sections of oriental motifs called Moresque by Flötner and Fasson Arabic by Pellegrino. They exhibit a further stage in the circulation of ornament, for they are rather closer to those found on early 16th century Venetian and Bolognese book bindings and metal and textiles than to their Middle Eastern prototypes. So you can see here that this is a Venetian binding in Ottoman style. Terms such as moresque are used generically without attempting to identify spe specific origins. Similarly for metalwork, the early da or di Damasco is gradually replaced in the 16th century by alla damaschina in Damascene style, a general term now also applied to pieces made in Italy. What is at work here is the creativity in technology and design for purposes of emulation and competition, resulting in the global vocabulary of ornament. No longer tied to specific origins or contexts, it can be transferred between media and creatively combined in new ways. The artistic vocabulary became increasingly international, calling into question for this period the validity of traditional art historical tropes such as exoticism, influence, and imitation. A scholar saint or a Renaissance humanist or merchant is often representing, represented in paintings of the period with various objects, uh, including ones of Middle Eastern origin, such as various types of metal ball and typically a beautiful carpet. In this frontispiece painting on, on the left, um, attributed to Botticelli School, uh, dated uh, uh, circa 1475, we find a representation of a small pattern Holbein carpet, so-called because it, it is a type often painted by Holbein the Younger. And the carpet, the real carpet you see on the right, is a small pattern Holbein, which is now called like this, also 
in the Middle East. So you have a whole museum, Kappen Museum in Turkey, in Istanbul, where you have a big hole with the Holbein carpets, but also you have a big hole with the Lotto carpets, um, turned after Lorenzo Lotto, uh, with different internal motifs, but both bordered by pseudo Kufic Arabic lettering, as you can see. The inclusion of pseudo lettering here, a form of displacement and creative reworking, is a phenomenon that begins much earlier. Already in the 13th century, in Cimabue's Madonna and Child with Angels in the Church of Santa Maria de Servi here in Bologna, uh, and you can you can see this uh, slide uh, um, in situ in the chapel of the church uh, where the, the painting is, well protected by a thick iron gate. And if you, if, if you wish to see it, bring with you 50 cent uh, coins to activate the lights. So here you find actually a representation of the painting you can see better. Um, we find that the textile covering the throne of the Madonna has, it, it's quite uh, worn, unfortunately, but it has um, on its upper border, and here you have the detail here, um, a pseudo-Arabic inscription, the lettering of which, here a form of Nasq, is very similar to that found, for example, on contemporary Syrian pottery. This is part of the phenomenon that I call cultural citation. The inclusion of exotic human types of depiction of exotic objects, textiles and, paint, and carpets in paintings, as signs of opulence. Such objects also include examples of Middle Eastern technology, such as astrolabes. An example of the widespread adoption of the astrolabe is one dated 1299 from Fez, with both Arabic and Latin inscriptions, as you can see here, the Latin inscription and the Arabic identifications. In representation of studioli, we often find brass incense or perfume burners, of which we have wonderful examples in the Museo Civico in Bologna, as this one here, or in the Galleria Estense in Modena. They are intricately decorated with silver and gold inlay, and often also have inscriptions in Arabic of a benedictory or augural type. The substance burning inside a little semispherical tray, this one here, um, could be ambergris, musk or alloy wood, and the mechanism ensure that the tray always remain horizontal so that the burner could be rolled. Indeed, as the 12th century poet Ibn Hamdis describes, they could be made to run over carpets, letting out smoke through the many small perforations in the metal. You can see the, main, the perforations here, and they're all over. So they were made to run over carpets, but some were meant to be hung and two in the Bargello Museum in Florence preserve part of the chain. The one in this painting by Holbein, again, is testimony to a category I call the exotic object as a prototype. An object of Middle Eastern origin now has decorative motifs and that reveal European manufacture. So you can see it here. And of course, you can also notice the small pattern Holbein carpet <laughs> covering the table. In Pico Passo's treatise on the art of ceramics and its ornaments, we find rabesque designs juxtaposed with trophies. 
And the generalizing vocabulary of Renaissance ornament seems to avoid any signaling of otherness. There is a lack of commentary in humanistic writings on the foreign nature of both Middle Eastern objects and the so-called arabesque. The humanist Sabba da Castiglione in his Ricordi, written in 1549, for example, juxtaposes a wide range of objects to adorn the home, including tapestries from, from Flanders, Turkish and Syrian carpets, leathers from Spain, and new strange and wonderful things from the Levant and Germany, cose nuove fantastiche e bizzarre, ma ingegnose, venute di Levante o d'Alemagna. He makes no distinctions of kind between European and Middle Eastern artifacts. His vocabulary indicates surprise and admiration, but it doesn't dwell upon the aesthetic dimension. Interestingly, he considers social and ethical aspects linked to these objects, concluding with e tutti questi ornamenti ancora commendo il laudo perché arguiscono ingegno, politezza, civiltà e cortigianía. All these ornaments or objects are to be commended and praised because they sharpen the intellect and induce politeness, civility and courtliness. They are seen as contributing to the development of desirable qualities of human mind and behavior. To conclude, the evident appreciation of Middle Eastern artifacts did not provide a separate threat in the tissue of scholarly discourse. The Ottoman desk rack that adorned the studio of the Renaissance scholar did not demand intellectual attention as the product of another culture. It had rather its own agency in projecting an element of the integrated world of Renaissance visual culture. The portrait you see on the screen is of a member of the Marcello family that was engaged with the Ottoman world in terms of both conflict and intellectual interests. His thoughts seem to be concentrated on the contents of the book that lies upon the carpet, one which we may well imagine to be part of the intellectual enterprise I've outlined. Book and carpet would thus represent in felicitous juxtaposition the twin strands of mercantile enterprise and intellectual inquiry that tie Europe and the Middle East so firmly together. Thank you very much. <laughs>